Go to Second uh, Peter tonight. Second Peter, chapter one. I mentioned this morning that uh, it's kind of a two part. This kind of uh, it goes along with the message I pre- preached this morning. I preached this morning about increasing uh, increasing knowledge. We ought to be trying to learn more. Don't get content with where you're at and just think you've arrived. We ought to constantly be learning, constantly trying to increase our our knowledge and trying to increase our skills. We ought to want to get better at what we do. Uh, but that's more on a physical level, on a practical level, but also spiritually. It's spiritually, we ought to be growing. We ought to be doing better. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according to as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that these uh, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside all uh, beside all this giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. So tonight I'm going to talk about adding to your faith. And if you go back in verse 4, um, you might notice here it talks about whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. All right, When we got saved, we became a new creature in Christ. We now have a spiritual nature. And if we will walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right. But yet we still do have the lust of the flesh, don't we? Nobody in here stopped desiring to sin after you got saved, but you did receive a new nature. And so now you've got something in you that says, you know what? I don't want to do these things anymore. I want to get away from these sins. I want to be, I want to be better. I want to overcome. I want to be more like Christ, but we do, we have that flesh. And so thank God that he's given us that, you know, he's revived our spirit. He's given us the Holy Spirit and we can, we can become more like Christ, but it's not a guarantee just because you're saved. It's not a guarantee that you're going to become more like Christ. We still have the lust of the flesh. And if we don't give all diligence, like it says, if we do not add to our faith, we're going to get in trouble. Our life is still going to stink. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to be happy. We're going to be miserable. We're not going to have the abundant life like we talked about this morning. But I believe though, I still, I still believe that a person that believes the Lord Jesus Christ, even if they never grow, they're still saved, but they're not going to have any rewards in heaven. And you know, a lot of, you've got these people out there, you know, I listened to a message just the other day about a guy who was basically teaching if a person you know, believes on Christ, but they never repent. You know, they never turn from their sins and start growing and becoming like they are in this church. They obviously never got saved. But, you know, that's that's not the case. And then at the same time, too, you know, what about these people that give their hearts to the Lord, that we, uh, you know, we give them the gospel, they pray and they get saved, but we never see any change in their life. They never get into church. You know, are these people for sure going to be in heaven? And, you know, the truth is, if they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be in heaven. But here's the thing. If they do not add to their faith, okay, then they will be barren and unfruitful. They will give give in to the lust of the flesh. They will deal with problems on this earth that a Christian should not deal with. They will have the chastening hand of God on them. And notice, you know, he's telling us in here in the, uh, uh, verse five, he says, add to your faith. Okay. What does it take to get saved? We're saved by grace 
through faith. The person, when they get saved, they get saved because of faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. No works. Faith. But God wants us after we get saved to add to our faith. But these things are not for salvation. These things are not to keep us saved. These are things so we can just be better off as Christians. Because you'll notice here in verse 9, uh, it said, or in verse 8, it says, For if these things be in you, you'll be need. It doesn't say if these things be in you, you know, you will be saved. No, it says if, you, if these things be in you, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful. Okay? You will be better off if you add these things to your life as a Christian. If you add these things to your faith, if you increase, we shouldn't, like, once again, I mentioned this morning, you know, once you get a diploma, you shouldn't just get satisfied and say, all right, I'm done learning. I got a high school diploma, therefore I can go through life and tell people I'm not an idiot. I graduated high school. No, you shouldn't be satisfied. You should keep learning. And just because you get saved, you shouldn't just say, all right, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm done doing anything. No, that's a problem. You need to add to your faith. If you don't, you're going to miss out. You're going to, you're going to wish you, you know, you're going to regret it later on. But it says, you know, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So it's very clear here that somebody who is saved can lack these things. You know, they, you're lacking these things. You're not going to be able to see afar off. You've forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. I believe there's many people out there who were saved, but if you tried to talk to them, you're not going to get a very clear testimony from them. You know why? Because even though they got saved, they never grew, they never learned anything, and they couldn't give you a clear salvation testimony. And I'll tell you this right now, these people, will they don't have assurance of their salvation. They're not going to have the joy of knowing that they are on their way to heaven. You know why? Because they never added to their faith. They, ne they never went to church. They never read their Bible. doesn't change the fact that they're still saved. They're still going to go to heaven. But it is very clear when we see this that people that get saved, you know, they might not ever add to their faith. But they're still saved. They're still going to go to heaven. But you know what? You all here, you're in church today. You're in church on a Sunday night. I'm going to just assume that the people that are in here tonight, you do. You want to be better. You know, you want to, you want to do more for Christ. You want to add to your faith. Your faith in Christ was all you needed to get into heaven. And you could, you could walk out this door tonight and never go to church again. And if you're saved, you're still going to go to heaven. But if you do not add to your faith, you are going to miss out on a lot of great things. You will be barren and unfruitful. Uh, and if you walk out of here tonight, you might have assurance of your salvation right now. But if you leave here tonight and you get away from God, I believe you're going to lose that assurance of your salvation. Later on, you might start to wonder. You're not going to be able to have that joy anymore and that peace. And you might not be able to die a peaceful death like a believer should die because you just, you've done nothing with your faith. You didn't add to it. And so notice some things that it says to add to it. it you know, it's, it's real clear here. It tells us exactly what to add. But the first thing it says, virtue. Okay? And virtue basically means strength. All right? Strength. You know, we're trying to add, we, we ought to want to strengthen our faith. How much faith does it take for a person to get saved? I personally believe it takes very little for a person to get saved. We see people in the Bible who Jesus did miracles for when they had very little faith. You had the, you know, Jesus asked the one man whose son was lunatic, you know, do you believe? He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. You know, a part of them believed, but a part of them didn't believe. You know, there were a lot of people, they, they, they struggled. They didn't have a lot of faith, but they had just enough to do what Jesus said. And you know what? They got what they needed. And I believe if you have just enough faith to say, you know what? I don't know everything about this Bible, but I believe that if I will call on the Lord for salvation, if I'll just trust in his work instead of my own, he'll save me. And I don't believe that takes a lot of faith for that. That doesn't, that doesn't take much faith for a person to get saved. But you know what? After you get saved, you ought to try to strengthen your faith. A new believer, they're going to struggle with a lot of things. It's very clear. We see examples in the Bible of people who get saved. But you know what? The cares of this world come. 
And, you know, and they choke them. They, uh, you know, they get offended when trials come their way and when persecution comes their way. You know, they get saved and maybe their family makes fun of them. They get pressure from their friends. And you know what? They never add to their faith. And, and they are, their faith is weak. A lot of times when people first get saved, the devil comes along because he doesn't want them being a witness. And what does he do? He starts bringing trials their way. And they don't have a lot of faith yet. And many times... They fall out and they get out of church. They get away from the things of God. And you know what? We shouldn't want that to happen to us. And so as believers, we ought to be adding virtue to our faith. We ought to be strengthening our faith. We ought to say, you know what? I want to become stronger Christians. And uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, uh, or just whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. There are some things that we ought to be trying to add in our life, things that we ought to be thinking of. And if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, if we're going to strengthen ourselves in some things, it ought to be these spiritual things. We ought to be trying, we ought to want to be stronger Christians. All right, I'm safe. I'm on my way to heaven, but you know what? I want to be a strong Christian. I want to be someone who has great faith. And we see in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9, it says, But as touching brotherly love, ye have not need that I write unto you for ye yourselves. Or, oh, wait, that's, for, that's not what I wanted. Um, well, I'm going to have to skip that passage. I wrote the, I wrote the wrong one down. But we, we ought to want to strengthen our faith. Or we ought, to want to, we ought to want to be stronger. And if we do, if we want that extra strength, oh, I'm looking at the wrong point. That's my problem. Uh, 2 Peter 1.3, that's what I wanted. 2 Peter 1.3, it says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him which hath called us to glory and virtue. God has called us to virtue. He wants us to be stronger. He wants us to strengthen our faith. Just like we weren't saved by good works, but we were saved unto good works. Okay, after we get saved, God wants us to add good works to our life. God wants us to add strength to our faith. And so if we do, if we have that, if we want to strengthen our faith, we should be okay with trials. Okay? Isn't that what people do when they go to the gym and when they exercise? What are you doing? You're purposefully putting yourself through a physical trial so you can do more. You know, I, I want to be able to lift this much weight because if I do this, if I, I'll strengthen myself and eventually I can lift even more weight. I, I, you know, I'll be able to accomplish more. I want to be able to run a mile under a certain time. So, and, then I, and you want to get faster at it. You want to get better at it. You're trying to strengthen yourself. And sometimes you put yourself through some painful things. Why? Because you want to be stronger. You know, there's no, and there's nothing wrong with that. But boy, the you know, Bible teaches that bodily exercise profiteth little. You know, godliness is profitable in all things. So why wouldn't we be willing to go through a hard time in our life? Why wouldn't we be willing to allow God to, you know, put us through a trial in our life? If we know if I get through this trial, I'll be stronger. I'll be a better Christian. My faith will be strengthened. And God has called us to, to glory uh, to, and virtue. And we ought, to, we ought to want to be strong Christians. We ought to be okay with spiritual trials. And so he says, after adding to your faith virtue and to virtue, knowledge. Okay? One thing, when it, com when it comes to physical exercise, okay, um, there it, knowledge is a big part of strength, okay? And being able to accomplish something physically. It's important that you, that you know your body. Okay, I've known a lot of younger people. I've, I've always been a good runner. I've always been good at running long distances. And there's, I, I can beat lots of, you know, in, in the past, I've beaten guys a lot younger than me in a lot better shape than me just because I have a lot of experience running and I know how to pace myself. You know, I know my body. I know how fast I, you know, I need to be running. And, and it just comes with, it just comes with practice. But what do a lot of young guys do that aren't used to running? You know, they'll weigh, you know, 20 or 30 pounds less than me. You know, they are, they're in a lot better shape than me. They're physically faster than me. But what do a lot of young guys do in like a 5K? Man, they just take off right from the get-go. I mean, they just blast off out in front of everybody. But then later they're huffing and puffing and they're dying. 
and they end up giving up. And then, you know, and, and a lot of times, too, some of the best runners that are out there are like people in their 40s and 50s. Why? Right? They, they know their bodies. They know how to pace themselves. They know how, uh, you know, they know how hard to run. And, and young people, they don't know that many times. And when it, and spiritually speaking, when we're going through difficulties, okay, those trials that we've been through in the past, they teach us how much we can endure. And so a lot of times too, that young person, that first time they run and they get that pain in their side, they're ready to call 911. You know, they think they're, they think they're going to die. You know, and so I, they, I've got to give up. I've got to quit. I'm hyperventilating, whatever. But that person who's experienced, they understand, you know, I can run through this. I can, I can overcome this. This isn't going to kill me. I'm going to be fine. We, they know exactly, you know, we know what we can take. And that, that knowledge comes after we go through trials. And when we do, when we deal with spiritual things, spiritual hardships, spiritual trials, we do, we find out, you know, we learn, we learn how to get through these difficulties. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. One of the things that we do as we go through trials, we learn more about God. And, what we, and when we learn about God and we learn grow in the knowledge of our Savior, when we're facing these things, it's like, you know, we know, we know God well enough to know God's going to get me through this. God's going to take care of this. Sometimes you, you almost even know how he's going to take care of it. We don't always know that, but we do. We just have that calm assurance that God is going to take care of this. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I've been through this a hundred times. We've seen this over and over again, and God always comes through. And we're, you just have that confidence. It, it comes you know, it, as you grow, as you add to your faith, as you add strength, as you add virtue. And you do, you just, you add that knowledge to it and it helps you get through those things. Colossians chapter two, turn over there real quick. Colossians chapter two and verse one it says, for I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of of understanding the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Okay, in him, in Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. As we grow in knowledge of the Lord, then it's going to make it much more difficult for the phonies to come along and to entice us and to trick us. And to trip us up. And you know, whenever you're going through, you know, and I've been, I'm talking about running and just physical trials, but you know, it's like spiritually speaking, whenever you're going through trials, you know, it is, it's, it's helpful having people cheer you on, isn't it? You know, it, it really helps, but you know, the devil, he does just the opposite. You know, the devil, he's the one telling you, you can't make it. You're going to die. You know, you've seen those people out there when they're out, when you're running those races, there's usually people that, you know, they try to cheer you on. You know, you're trying to, you know, maybe you, you got a child out there running. You're, you know, you're not going to die. You're not, you know, you're not, you know, you can do this. And, you know, you're trying to get people to run through it and get through those difficulties. And when it comes to the challenges that we face in our life, you know, you've got the devil that comes along and he'll entice you. You know, you can't do that. You've got the false prophets that come along and they will deceive people and they'll bring doubts people's way. Or maybe not even just a false prophet, but maybe just a coworker, maybe a family member. They do, they just, they put doubt in your mind, but you know what? When you grow in knowledge, as you get to know the Lord, as you learn the scriptures and you read about the promises that God gives, it does, it just gives you an assurance and you know, you know what? I don't need to listen to these people. I know what the Bible says. I can get through this thing. I'm going to be okay. And many people, they do, they end up, they stop there. They don't learn, they don't grow in knowledge like we talked about this morning. They're not trying to learn more about the Bible. They don't study the Word of God and things come along and they get tripped up. You know, the devil comes along, he entices them, he gets them caught up in false doctrine or something, and sure enough, they end up, they end up in trouble. But we ought, we ought to challenge ourselves with the Bible. You know, do things like, you know, like memorizing the books of the Bible. 
You know, memorizing the Ten Commandments, memorizing scriptures, memorizing the Romans road. Just do these things. Why? It'll help. You know, read, you know, reading through the Bible. I talked this morning about that Bible family tree thing I did. Why do we do these things? We're trying to increase our knowledge. Every other year, I like to read through the chronological Bible. Where I have a Bible where everything is in there in chronological order. And it kind of puts a new perspective on some things. And it helps me. I grow in knowledge when I do that. And it, the more we grow, the more, we, uh, you know, gain, more knowledge that we gain in these things, the harder it's going to be for us to get fooled by the phonies and the false prophets. And, I mean, have you ever been there before where you heard something preached and, man, there was something in your spirit that you're like, man, something is wrong here. And it, a lot of times it's discouraging because you know something's wrong. The Holy Spirit's telling you something's wrong. But you know what? You don't have much Bible knowledge. And so now, what do I do? Do I listen to this guy? Do I trust this guy? Or do I actually do the homework? You know, do I, and a lot of people, man, they're just too lazy to do the work. They don't add that knowledge and they end up getting tripped up. They end up getting in trouble. And so then after that, and this kind of goes right into the next point, after we add knowledge, he says temperance. Okay. You know, and that temperance is basically, you know, self-control. Once again, why don't we want to study the Bible? Like we should all that stuff we talked about this morning, you know, in increasing in knowledge. Why don't we want to do these things? It's because we don't have any temperance in our life. We don't have any self-control. We can't control ourselves. It is so much easier to watch television than it is to read the Bible. It's so much easier to just sleep in in the morning instead of getting up a little bit early and getting alone with God, doing some praying, doing some Bible reading. We have, we have no self-control. It's a lot easier to just stay home and watch a football game instead of going to church. You know, it's a lot easier to just you know, relax on Saturday instead of going soul winning and doing the things that we know we should be doing, but we, don't, we, we have no control. You know, we, fasting. No, nobody wants to fast these days. Why? Because what do we do when we get hungry? Immediately. We've got to be throwing something in our mouth and we're all screaming and you know, getting angry and turning into the Hulk whenever we just go a little bit without food. There's no, you know, no self-control, no temperance in our life. And we've got to add that to our life because the fact that, you know, in adding strength okay, and adding knowledge in our life, these things are not easy. They take work. They're hard. It goes against our nature. We still have that lust of the flesh. And so we've got to be adding these things and we've got to add that temperance. I got to figure out how to get this body under control and fasting is a wonderful way to do that if you can control your appetite you know you can control pretty much anything you know and i was thinking about this the other day because you, know, you hear these preachers that are out there too that teach this stuff that you know if you don't turn from all your sins you're not really saved and you'll hear these preachers that get up and you know, before i got saved i was a drunk i was a drug addict i smoked I chewed, but boy, when I got saved, I gave up all that stuff and I never went back to it. Yeah, but you know what? Then you went from all those things to just eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. And you know what? And you, and you know, now you're a glutton. You have no self-control in that area. You know why? Because you didn't really change. Yeah, you just picked the new bad habit over the one that you had. You didn't change at all. But you know, we... You know, we don't think anything of that because nobody talks about that. Nobody preaches about that. But that, once again, you know, we, do, we, we need to practice self-control. I think that's one of the main reasons God does fasting. We, you, know, you know why we're not spiritual? Because we're so stinking carnal. We're so devoted to this flesh. And I believe fasting helps discipline us a little bit. Some people say it causes us to pray more. Every time you get a hunger pain, you pray. I think that's part of it. That's true. You're going to be praying a lot while you're fasting, but I think God wants us to do it so we can get some self-control. You know, temperance, that's one, that's one of the fruit of the Spirit that we see in Galatians 5.23. You know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. We need to have self-control. That self-control will help us avoid different sins. You know, you're not going to go be as likely to go around cussing 
and blaspheming if you've got some self control. You're you're gonna be much uh, you're gonna be less likely to lose your job because you know you lost your temper with a coworker and punched somebody. You know you're it's gonna save you so much trouble. How many times have you had a bad week in your marriage because of one thing that you said? You know. A little bit of self-control could have avoided a whole bad week. If you just had a little bit of temperance, you, you would have avoided that. And so we need, to, we need to understand we've got to be adding these things to our life. Discipline ourselves. I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray every day. I'm going to make this a part of my life. I'm going to have a disciplined routine. And there are, there's a lot of people out there who... They do. They figure out how to, man, they'll get their diet in control. I mean, they've got this strict exercise routine. And I even know a lot of Christians like this too. You know, you've got these Christians that are out there and they do, they get all this physical stuff figured out. They've got the healthy diet. They've got the exercise program. They lose all the weight. They get themselves in great shape. And now all of a sudden they think their spirituals all get out. But during all those months of doing that, they didn't read their Bible. They didn't win anybody to Christ. They didn't do anything spiritual during that time. And they act like they're the spiritual ones because they got their body under control. And listen, I do. I believe if we practice self-control physically, I, th- I believe it can help us spiritually too. But you know what? If being under, you know, having self-control physically means we're, we have self-control spiritually, well then, who should be the most spiritual people in the world? Athletes. And they're some of the most wicked people in the world. You know why? Because they just have different you know, things of the flesh that they get all caught up in. But we, we need to be adding these things to ourselves. And then after temperance, okay, you know, that self-control, it's hard. And you can see how these things go along. So if you're going to have temperance in your life, you're going to have to have some patience. You're going to have to add patience. And we all hate this one. But we all know that we're supposed to have patience in our life. And Romans 8.25 says, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Sometimes we just have to wait for things. We've got to wait for God to come through. Longer than we want to. There's plenty of things that I'm praying for right now that I thought God would have taken care of a long time ago. I thought, I thought He'd answer that prayer a long time ago. But you know what? I'm still waiting for it. And I'm going to keep wait, I've got to keep waiting for it. And you know what? We ought, we're supposed to want to be adding these things to our faith. We're supposed to be wanting to add patience in our life. But do you understand that for us to grow in patience means we have to have times where we wait on the Lord? And those might be for us to really grow in patience. We might have to wait a really long time. And once again, you know, then do we with patience wait for it? It's like we want patience and we want it now. Don't we? And, you know, and it's just like, uh, no, the whole thing with patience and learning patience is waiting and waiting a really long time. And you know, the longer we wait, the more patience we will gain, the more that we will learn. But, and, and the thing is too, after you add patience in your life, you know, after you've, you know, I mean, for a long time, you waited on something and God finally came through in whatever the situation is, you realize it's going to help you in all these other things we've talked about. It'll help you have a little more temperance the next time. The next time you face a trial, you know, where before, I mean, you were just antsy, you were doubting God, you will have the knowledge of that previous situation. You will remember that you survived that. You'll remember that God got you through that. You have and that temperance, that knowledge that you've learned, it has now increased your faith. And while you're going through something really difficult, you've got all those things. Now you've got the faith, you've got the knowledge, you've got the temperance, and you've got some patience. And now that the next trials come your way, you're going to do a lot better because you've added some things to your faith. You know, and I, I'm tired of seeing people just, you know, giving up on different trials and just falling out and getting out of the will of God and getting out of church. And listen, it, this is, it's going to keep happening until Jesus comes back. We're going, to see, we're going to see this kind of thing. But you need to understand that while you, you see these things happen to other people, it could happen to you too if right now you're not adding things to your faith. 
You might think, I don't need these things right now. Things are fine right now. I'm happy where, where I'm at right now. I'm, con- I'm content with myself right now. But once again, like we talked about this morning, you need to add. You need to increase. Because if you don't know what's coming down the road, you don't know what kind of trial God might want to put you through in the future. And if you're not adding to your faith right now, it might may only be a matter of time before you fall out. Before you're the next casualty. So right now, you ought to be exercising yourself spiritually. So you'll be ready for these things. And and so adding patience. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Many times we go to the Scriptures to help us have patience. We like reading the stories about how God came through for people. I like reading the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But you know the thing that we forget about that? Do you realize Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown in the fiery furnace? You know Daniel got thrown into the lion's den? Sometimes God might actually want us to go through that trial that we're asking Him to help us avoid. And I, I've used this bef- this illustration before, but you know, when we when you read that story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can read it pretty fast. It's all in one chapter. But understand, if we were in that situation, if we would have been them, what would our prayer have been? Lord, don't let me get thrown in the furnace. Lord, don't let me get thrown in the furnace. But y'all realize that's the best part of the story. They got thrown in the furnace, but God got them through it. And you know what? Most of our prayers that we have in our life are, Lord, don't put me through the trial. Don't, Lord, don't let this happen to me. Lord, don't ever let me go through that. But listen, God might want you to go through that because that's going to be the best part of the story. That's what's going to help you add these things to your faith and you might be able to be a help to someone else. We get helped all the time from these stories that we learn about in the Old Testament. And you going through a trial in your life might be a help to someone else in the church when they're going through difficulty, you can go tell them your story. Hey, you know what? God doesn't just deliver people in the Bible. He delivered me too. God doesn't just, didn't just get Daniel through a lion's den. Let me tell you what he put me through in my life. And you, your patience that you have, that you've learned, can help someone else. Hey, I've been where you're at. I, I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen what you've seen. I know what this is like. And you can help that person in a way that nobody else can. Because God's given you that. And so because you've added to your faith, now you're able to be a blessing to other people in ways that not everybody can be a blessing. And so you you might think, I don't need this now, but you don't know when you're going to need it later. So be adding to your faith. And so after that, patience, it says in the patience, godliness. Why does God put us through these things. He wants us to become more like him. He wants us to be like him. You know, it's like we have this idea that because we still have the flesh, we have an excuse for being carnal. We have an excuse for being sinful. But listen, God gave us the spirit so we wouldn't have to walk in the flesh. So we could walk in the spirit. So we wouldn't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We have the ability to be godly. We don't have to sin. Just because, you know, it's going to happen, or probably, you know, that we're, go- we're going to have failures, you know, it's, it's not an excuse for us to just slack off. You know, let's see how much of this sin we can avoid. Let's see if we can't just go our entire life without doing these things. You know, go ahead and challenge yourself. I'm, you know, I, and I don't say these things bragging, but I use these things to motivate me. You know what? I'm 36 years alcohol free. And you know what? I'm going for 37. And, I, and you know what? I, I don't want to go take that first drink because I don't want to have to start over. I, I don't want to have to start the streak all over. It's going to take me 37 years. Forget that. I might as well just do it again. And isn't that what people do? That's why you never want to commit that sin the first time. It's just easier to do it the next time. But you know what? Okay, maybe it hasn't been that long for you. But you know what? Start start new and just keep going. Challenge yourself. Try you know try to get better. Try to become more like Christ. 
Try, try to, you know, try to get your, where you're thinking like him. You know, learn his words. You know, use, apply them in your life. You know, I, I hate to just use a cliche, but what would Jesus do? Practice that in your life. How would he respond in this situation? I want to be like him. And we, we do these things all the time when it comes to, you know, uh, the physical things. You know, famous athletes. I remember, you know, when I was younger, of course, Michael Jordan, he was the biggest thing. And I can't tell you how many times I watch guys dribble a basketball down the court with their tongue hanging out of their mouth. You know, why would you do that? That's what Michael Jordan did. You know, I mean, we did, we would always copy the things that we saw these other athletes do, things that didn't even necessarily help. Why would we, why did we do those things? Because we wanted to be like that athlete and we would do the weird things. We would dress the weird ways. One thing that Michael Jordan, too, contributed greatly to society. His greatest contribution to society is he is one that kind of brought in the baggy shorts, the longer shorts. Remember those nasty Daisy Dukes they used to wear in basketball? You know, then Michael Jordan came along, he started wearing the longer shorts. And now, you know, people don't, most, most guys don't wear those shorts. And I'm thrilled about that. And I think that's great. I think those are disgusting. You know, we're not supposed to be showing our thigh. And so that I think that's his greatest contribution to society right there. I've been told that he was the one that uh, kind of got that going. And so God bless him for that. Uh, I hope he gets in heaven just on that. No, I'm just kidding. You know, that, that's, that's not going to do it. But, but we, do, we, we, we see those things and, and we copy it. And, you know, and it's sad, too. All, you know. I, there, a while back, I haven't been seen as much of it lately, but, and I, I'm not sure for sure where it originated, but remember that thing? It seemed like last year, a lot of women were shaving the sides of their head. You know, why would any, why would any woman do something that hideously ugly? You know why? Because I, I think it was some singer or some actress or something that was doing it and they try to be like them. And we, and you know, sadly, even Christians we do those things sometimes. We go and we copy off worldly people, sometimes wicked people. Why don't we do that with Christ? Why don't we add godliness to our faith? All right, I'm saved. And if I'm saved, I've got the Spirit of Christ in me. So you know what? I'm going to start acting like Him. I'm going to start giving the Holy Spirit control in my life so I can be more like Him. We have the ability to be like Christ you know, why don't we do it? You know, and, and we do, you know, we love the stories about the miracles that Jesus did. And I'm not saying if you come enough like him, you're going to go around healing people of their blindness and things like that. But you know what? Maybe if we become enough like Christ, we might start having enough faith. We might become a real prayer warrior. One of those people that just knows how to get their prayers answered. One of these people who sees great things happen, maybe become a great soul winner. We, may not, we might not raise anybody from the dead physically, but we're seeing people raised from the dead spiritually all the time. Why? Because we're becoming like Christ. We're adding godliness in our life. 1 Timothy 4, 7, you know, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Well, it, you are not going to naturally want to act like Christ. So you know what you got to do? You got to exercise yourself. You know, if, if you want to get the bigger biceps, you know, you don't get that from lifting a spoon to your mouth every day. You know, our normal chores that we do, you know, you got to go get some weights and you got to lift those. Do you have to do things that aren't pleasant, things that you don't really want to do. And if we want to become more like Christ, we've got to do things that go against what this flesh wants to do. And on purpose, on purpose, we have to make an effort to be like Christ, and it's not going to be easy because we've got this flesh in our way, but we can do it if we'll add that godliness. And then it says, and to add godliness, brotherly kindness. Uh, Romans 12.10. Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another, with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Now, how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to have brotherly kindness? Well, that comes with godliness. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And why did he do all those things? So he could come and he could die for us. He was thinking about us. 
he was thinking about others. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. Jesus did that. Well, I don't want to do that. I'd rather be selfish. I would rather take care of my needs than someone else's. Okay, well, that's where the exercise comes in. Well, guess what? Jesus didn't do that. He thought about other people. So you know what? Forget about what you want right now and do something for somebody else. Go. I don't feel like it. I know. But do it anyway. Jesus didn't feel like going to the cross, but he went to the cross, didn't he? The Bible says he despised the shame, but he did that. I don't feel like being nice to my brothers in Christ. I don't feel like being loving, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyway because that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. So I'll do that too. And I'll, I'll be kindly affectionate one to another. I'll be, you know, uh, be like Christ. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, but it's touching brotherly love. Ye need not that I write to you, for your, ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. He taught us that, he told us that, and he showed us how to do it. He did it. He set the example in that area. And so we ought to add brotherly kindness and the brotherly kindness, charity. Just showing that love. And not, and once again, when, it, when we're talking about charity, this isn't just talking about a feeling, but this is talking about action, doing things for other people, you know, giving, going out of your way to help people, you know, just having that, that affection for others, just, you know, thinking about other people's needs. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we don't have time to go through it, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13, great passage about charity. We ought to have these things in our life. I don't feel like doing that. What do your kids want to do? What do your kids all do when they're little? They get selfish with stuff, don't they? They scream when their brothers or sisters take something that, that's theirs. You know, they do. They get they get greedy with things. You know, they and you don't even you don't teach them that, do you? Nobody ever taught you know. Nobody ever taught their kid. Hey, if you see your brother or sister touch one of your toys, scream. You know, you, you don't teach them that. They just do it. It's completely natural for us to be selfish. But being charitable and doing without something so we can help somebody else, that does not come naturally. That's something that we do when we add things to our faith, when we're exercising ourselves to godliness, trying on purpose to be like Christ, which goes against our nature. That's when we do those things. And we ought to be trying to reach new levels in our spiritual life. We ought, we ought, to, we ought to do that. We ought to be challenging ourselves. I want to get to that next level. I want to do that next thing. You know, uh, in running, I, I ran in a 10K here in town one day. Well, now, you know, next time yeah, I'd like to do a 15. You know, try to add to that. You know, I, I'm, always trying to, I'm always trying to beat my times, trying to do better. That's fine, but that's just, that's in the physical stuff. But you know what? What if we start doing that in the spiritual stuff? You know what? I used to just go to church once a week, but I'm going to start going twice a week. I'm going to go three times a week. You know what? Not only, I'm not even just going to go to church. I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. I'm going to read through the Bible every year. You know what? I'm going to, read through, I'm going to see if I can read through the Bible two, year, two times in a year. Just start adding things. You know, trying to do better. Adding your faith. And so, you know, when it says in this passage, if we have these things in our life, we will never fall. Okay? Uh, go back to, there to uh, 2 Peter. I'm not going to quote this right if I don't go back and look at it. But it says, Oh, I lost my spot again. If, oh, I'm in 1 Peter. That's my problem. 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, uh, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see it far off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. What's that saying? Is, it, is this saying that we can lose our salvation? Obviously, we know that's not the case. We can't lose our salvation. When it says this, it's telling us if we have these things in our life, these are things that will help give us assurance of our salvation. These things are not required for salvation, but as, a, as an individual... When you're adding these things to your life and you're growing in Christ, it's going to help you have assurance. And that assurance of salvation is a very important thing for every one of us as an individual to try to get. 
because of the fact the Bible makes it very clear that there's going to be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied thy name? And thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Those people thought they were saved, didn't they? There's going to be many people that stand before God who thought that they were saved, but they were not saved. And the truth is, I believe there's a lot of saved people out there who do not have assurance of their salvation, who do not know that they're saved, but they are on their way to heaven and they're going to go to heaven. But I also believe there's a lot of people out there that think they're saved, they think they're on their way to heaven, that are not going to heaven. So how can we know for sure that we're going to heaven? Well, let's start adding to our faith. Let's start, let's start, start learning what the Scriptures say. And as we add these things in our life and as we grow, these things being in our life will give us assurance and that it will help us to know that we're saved. It will help us to know and we, want, we don't have to be one of those people that are like, Lord... And he says, I never knew you. And how do we keep that from happening? We add to our faith. A lot of people say they have faith, but the truth is, their faith is in the wrong things. Their faith is in their works. Their faith is in their church. And And so, these people are not saved. And we don't want that to happen to us. And so, you know, you do. You, you get these Christians, you get these real spiritual people out there, that they've got a problem, they get so mad at people like us who think these people are getting saved that we witness to. And it's like, no, if they're not growing, if they're not you know, as spiritual as I am and as miserable as I am, you know, then they're not really saved. Well, I believe if they put their faith and trust in Christ, they are. But if they don't add to their faith, they're going to miss out on a lot of things in their life. They will be barren. They will be unfruitful. If a person is out there and they think they're saved and they don't start trying to add some things to their faith, that person might be one of those who says, Lord, Lord, and they're like, he's like, apart from me, I never knew you. And so listen, these people that we witness to that never grow, I'm not going to stand here and say, oh, these people are okay, they've got nothing to worry about. No. You know, they need, they need to get in church. They need to start reading their Bibles. They need to start adding to their faith. Because they need to be fruitful. They're going to regret it when they stand before God. There's going to be a lot of saved people that go into heaven and are going to have nothing but regrets because of the fact they have no rewards. They didn't do anything for God. And I don't want that to to be me. And I don't want that to be you here in the church. And so all, all of us in here, we need to start adding to our faith. I hope nobody in here is satisfied with where they are in their Christian life. You need to be adding to your faith. Every one of these things that are mentioned, like, oh, I've got all those things. All right, well, try to make get more. I've got patience. Well, try to get more patience. I've got self-control. Try to get more self-control. Add these things in your life, and if you do, you'll never fall. And that, that, I don't believe that's talking, you know, that could be talking to just about, you know, falling in your Christian life. You know, failing, messing up, getting out of the will of God. I don't want that. I don't want to fall as a pastor. I don't want to be, I don't want to have a big scandal come up and ruin my reputation, ruin the reputation of this church. But if I don't add to my faith, that could happen. I could fall into sin. And so we've got to make sure we put these things in our life. So add to your faith. So with that, let's all stand together.